I've always been fascinated with Bigfoot. You know, when you're doing a Bigfoot investigation, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for prints like this. It's pretty scary, you know. And the first time I found prints like this up in Bailey, Colorado, God, it was eye-opening experience. It was, it's almost as if it was a religious experience. Because I'm looking at something this big, left, right, left, right, four foot gate, four feet between footprints and thinking, oh my God, something this big is out here walking around. But first, let's just start with uh, what people describe. We have enough evidence that we could convict Bigfoot, <laughs> you know, for being Bigfoot. So I started thinking about going on a quest looking for Bigfoot myself. When I look at the Bigfoot legend, I start thinking, you know, when did I start really being interested in it? And it's gonna probably be uh, a little weird here because there was a show with a $6 million man and where he had this bionic arm and there came the Bigfoot. And that was my probably first real introduction to the Bigfoot, the fascination uh, of the power of this. And so I started getting more involved in it and the more involved, you know, I had to see for myself, if I get into Bigfoot investigations, what am I getting myself into? One of the advantages of living in Colorado, I used to live in California. Being out here in Colorado, there's more of a Native American influence out here. It's really interesting as a UFO investigator, when I talk to Native Americans and Native American elders about UFO sightings and, you know, the sky travelers and stuff, I always mention Bigfoot because they always have they always have stories within their culture that's been going on for centuries, you know, and the stories told over and over and over again. So this is nothing new to us, or definitely nothing new to the Native Americans. It's just new to the people who don't understand the concept of Bigfoot. They just think, ah, Bigfoot. Well, they just thought, ah. Eh, UFOs until recently when the Pentagon finally came out and said, yeah, we're going to start investigating UFOs. There's probably enough evidence, circumstantial evidence, coming from the, you know, from the Native American stories that if you use that evidence in court today, you could probably convict someone of murder. Former law enforcement, if you have enough circumstantial evidence against someone who convict you know who committed a crime you know, they can go to jail for it you don't have to have pictures of this guy actually stealing or robbing someone although it helps <laughs> you know? so there's a lot of circumstantial evidence about bigfoot and then uh, obviously there's a lot of uh, evidence when it comes down to uh, footprints what i find out mostly is not only how secretive this creature is but first let's just start with uh, what people describe. You know, sometimes it's an ape-like creature. Uh, sometimes uh, we refer to maybe it's a man-type creature. Uh, and then there's just all of this shape-shifting ideas. So there's a lot of things that come into uh, Bigfoot. But at the end of the day, um, we all probably agree that there's some type of human characteristics could be involved in the Bigfoot sighting. Now, this casting is from the Patterson case, the, the, the famous Bigfoot footage that you always see on TV and every one of the shows. This casting is actually not from that sighting. This casting was a year before. This is what got um, the, uh, Patterson to go back to the area and look for Bigfoot. He, now this casting is, is a direct copy from the original one that I happened to pick up from uh, another investigator uh, who was friends with the Patterson family. So this, I'm really excited about this. And of course, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is definitely massive. Well, I think when you think about what would be the best evidence out there, we have to really go look at the, the Patterson Gimlin film. Uh, this was in 1967, uh, and this was a uh, where they got a shot of a Bigfoot walking through this forest. Uh, and so why is this probably so significant? 
number one, it was enough viewpoint that people can see that is something uh, besides this blurry, blurry shots of real short, quick. Uh, so I think that was probably the first real evidence that people saw uh, to really, really heighten the interest that something is out there and we need to really explore what it is. Uh, and so I think that was probably the most significant moment was that particular film. Uh, the reason why this particular case, uh, the Patterson case, is so credible is because how it was filmed. We didn't have a digital you know, era back then. We didn't have Adobe Photoshop. Didn't have computers where we could manipulate with film, like with special effects, something you would see from the Disney movies or some from the old horror flicks and stuff. So when you look at the Patterson film clip and you're thinking, okay, how are they able to do that with that technology at that period? Now, since then, um, there have been some investigators uh, that are an uh, institute, basically, that took the Patterson footage and completely digitized it and analyzed it. And when they digitized it, they were able to bring a little more clarity of the, of the actual film. And when they saw that clarity, it was, oh my God, they could see muscle striations. And they could see in the arms. They could see in the legs, they could see breasts, they could see movement of, of, of the muscles and of the fat. And, and they realized, oh my God, this, this, there's no way that this could be a guy in a suit. Sure, the, the debunkers say, well, well, of course, because we have suits that have, they have water, rubber sacks and stuff inside with water to kind of give you that. But we didn't have that back then when the footage was shot. This is, this is kind of newer technology. Now, the thing about the Patterson case, it wasn't anything where he made a lot of money on this. It was, I captured footage of a Bigfoot. And it wasn't like he was out at that time selling it and that it was all for profit. He was an investigator like me. He was a Bigfoot investigator and he decided that uh, after finding a footprint, he decided to go out there with the camera and see if he could actually capture something. Pretty cool. That's probably why it's one of the best sightings still. Is there any other evidence out there uh, when it comes down to Bigfoot? Now, me being a UFO investigator, uh, how is there some, you know, side-by-side -side correlation between Bigfoot and UFOs? Uh, and what we have have heard through a lot of the people that have reported Bigfoot sightings, there's always been some type of light. And so we tend to feel that that could be some type of connection. Now, I start coming up with my own theory, my personal theory. And, and I think it should be something we should look at based upon the evidence that's out there. Let's start with the Bigfoot smell. This is something that people report. In fact, the smell has been known to rattle most people, something they never smelled before, something they'll never forget. Let's put that to the side, the smell. Let's also put the evidence of how they just disappear out of nowhere. They're gone. We can't find them. And let's put the evidence of lights, UFO sightings, and that's bring it all together. We as humans um, tend to have pets. We have pets. And if you were had a house in the middle of nowhere, maybe in the, the mountains, maybe out in the woods, it's complete darkness, you decide to let your pet out to use the restroom to relieve itself. And when the door opens, that's the remnants of some light because you can see it from afar. It's just, that's all you see. Now, when a pet goes out and does its business, we're going to start getting the smell of what's happening, which, of course, Bigfoot probably does it big time, okay? It's bigger than most cases, so this is a big smell, okay? So, I start thinking, could Bigfoot be pets of the extraterrestrials? So, they cloak their spaceships, and they let it out to take a break. And now, this is why we can't track it, can't find it. And people think, okay, it's shapeshifts. But, and because I don't believe it has the 
wherewithal for technology. It's not, it's not speaking. It's not using, uh, you know, ray guns and suits. There's still got a primitive thing to it. So could it be a pet? And this is why the track stops. This is why we're smelling what we're smelling for that moment. Uh, and it disappears out of nowhere and why we can't find it. That's my concept. That's it. That's my theory. <laughs> so. You have to understand when you, when you investigate Bigfoot, you're investigating a mammal that, you know, is a good nine to 10 feet tall. Uh, if you, a, a regular chimp, chimpanzee can rip an arm off a human. They're that strong. They can rip you apart. So uh, the Bigfoot, could you imagine, could probably just tear you in half. And unfortunately, I, I've actually read a couple of uh, case reports from the Sheriff's Department out of Tennessee where there were two incidences where people were killed. Bigfoot investigators in the area seemed to think it might have been a rogue Bigfoot at the time. One of the incidents that I read clearly on this case report was um, that a hunter came up to, the, he was hunting and there was a tree and the tree had a hole in the middle and there was a, a human body, a torso that was shoved, pushed in the, the hole of the tree. Now the arms and legs were taken off and they were stuck on the branches and the gun was broken in half laying there. Now, when I read the sheriff's report on it, it, it basically said, you know, it was just some maniac guy, you know, some deranged guy. But if you look at it from a Bigfoot perspective, that's an area, and this was in the Appalachians. Now, that was an area where uh, there's been a lot of Bigfoot sightings. We've always talked about how you never, if you saw Bigfoot and you have a gun, you never shoot Bigfoot. You, know, you never want to piss them off. <laughs> So the story we think, and this is, this is just an assumption, okay, is this guy took a shot at one and either he heard it and one of his companions, you know, got him or maybe the one that he shot got him, killed him, made an example, a warning sign with the broken gun. I mean, it was unusual that that would happen, that you would just, you would just take a, a high-powered rifle snap it in half and lay it there. Okay, that was, the, that was the first story. The second story I read, there was a young couple that were on a, di a day hike and uh, they came into this opening. Same Appalachian Mountain area, not the same location. His explanation was it was a Bigfoot that had killed a deer and was picking a deer up. And they came up on the opening uh, you know, out of the woods and his girlfriend was just panicking. She just started screaming because she's just, you know, my God, my God, what is this thing, you know? They walked over, broke her in half, dropped her right there, walked back, picked up the deer and walked away. Left the kid alone. He didn't say a word. He was in shock. You know, the whole time he's just in shock and he watched this thing come over and kill his girlfriend. And, his... and when you read the report, that's what he says. Law enforcement said, it had to have been a bear walking on its hind legs over to her, killed her, walked back on its hind legs, picked up the deer and walked away on its hind legs. <laughs> because law enforcement, I mean, I've been in law enforcement. You can't really say on a case report, it was a Bigfoot, it was an alien, it was a UFO. You know, with cattle mutilations, anytime an animal is, is found dead of unusual circumstances and Law enforcement who investigated it, they can tell that it wasn't a mountain lion or a bear or coyotes, that it wasn't a predator. Uh, the best I can say is animal cruelty. It had to be a human, even though there's no human evidence either. But they have to put, a lot of times the law enforcement agencies won't let them leave it as an unknown. Most of the time they say, well, pick one. Because these guys don't know. It's better if they just leave it as an unknown because it makes it better. But it depends. The department I worked for, El Paso County Sheriff's Department, they're the ones who are more anti-UFO. So they would say, no, oh, it can't be a UFO. Now since the Pentagon's come out and saying, hey, UFOs appear to be real, and just within the last week or so, actually came out, it was members in Congress actually, they came out and stated, yeah, 
We have to start investigating these things as if they're extraterrestrials. We don't think they're terrestrials. And, and that was just like a week ago. So we're getting that way. Now, if we're getting that way with UFOs, we've been having Bigfoot sightings for centuries out here in North America. So I started thinking about going on a quest looking for Bigfoot myself. What would I look for? What would I do? What would I take with me? What kind of equipment or, or whatever? Uh, of course, you want your infrared. Uh, now, do I take any arsenal for protection? Uh, but I think trackers. I would probably take some, and it wouldn't be dogs because they would hear them a mile away, uh, but we're going to have to look for footprints. Uh, we have to know where we were going. But then if I had access to military capabilities, which we should, you know, drones that can fly thousands and thousands of feet undetected with infrared cameras, and we probably could find a Bigfoot pretty quickly. Uh, that if it has normal body heat, one of the first Bigfoot investigations as I did was in Bailey, Colorado, and uh, it was a, a nurse that uh, had moved back from Hawaii, and she had this cabin that butted up to the National Park. She physically saw what she described as a, a, a shorter Bigfoot running across the back of her backyard. So we went out there. You learn things when you do big, when you do investigations. I don't want to say just Bigfoot, but when you do UFO investigations, there's a lot of things that if, if you don't actually run an investigation right, you may take some of the evidence to think is actually related to that investigation where it's actually Mother Nature doing it. I had cameras set up, I had, uh, motion sensing cameras, and I had DVR cameras set up. We spent a couple of nights out there, so I had DVR cameras set up there at night, and uh, we would put food on the balcony of her porch because she said the food was being taken. Now, at that point, I never saw any footprints. At that point, it was just doing an investigation. So the next morning we come out and the food's gone off the plate. Like, oh yeah, all right. So I'm, I'm going through my, my video footage from the DVR. <laughs> and that's where I learned about flying squirrels. <laughs> it's really cool. I had footage of a squirrel jumping like I don't know how many feet from a tree branch onto the balcony, eating the food off the plate and then jumping back and thinking, okay, debunked, that is. But she still physically saw uh, a, a Bigfoot out there. The back of her, her, her house, and the forest was there and then there was a hill that kind of slumps up and there was snow up there. So we started climbing up and figuring, well, maybe if something came down, it came from inside the National Forest. And as we got in and where we started seeing snow, I'm looking right down and there's footprints. And I, I get chills now, even, you know, first time I've seen that. So, you know, the footprints were basically, they were basically this big in the snow. They were, they were at least 20 inches. We, we followed them backwards you know, where they were coming from, and it, it went into these rocks. It was, a, it was a little ways. So we lost track of the sites, and then we followed them down towards where the cabin was. And as we came, came down following the footprints off the edge of the hill, and there was about four feet in between each print, we come across these two giant aspen logs, and they're a good 18 feet. 20 feet tall and they were crossed like this and they just didn't fall you could clearly see that the branches on the trees that they came down and they were placed in a branch to make an X now if you do go if you do Bigfoot investigations Bigfoot likes to put markers I think maybe that's where maybe the Native Americans learned you know trail markers because Bigfoot does trail markers too and so they'll do the trail markers and and if you're ever out in an area where there's been Bigfoot sightings, how you look for the trail markers is you get off the trails and you follow the animal trails. They're a little bit different, a little harder to find, but you can see them. The hunters know them because they follow the trails when they're doing deer elk hunting. So you're on an animal trail and you look up about 10 feet and you can, and you can see some of the markers where their tree branches are broken and twisted around. And so we, were, we, fall, we actually saw a couple of those, we're following them, but the X, if you went past where this, these X was, then you started getting into 
cabins, people that were living down there. So it was almost as if stay away from that area because people are down there. And the markers went the other way. And that was, that was one of those big moments for me where I realized that not only is there something that large out there walking, I, I can see evidence of the footprints. Well, when you come back into the Bigfoot stories, you know, you're looking for what would be the, uh, the evidence, you know, because the main thing that people say uh, and why we call it a Bigfoot is because there are some big footprints that have been found. Whatever this is that made this particular footprint, you know, you got height, you got size, weight for the impression. Uh, and so they make a determination that this is some large creature. By looking at the steps, then you say, okay, it walks on two legs. And so it's got human-like uh, characteristics. Who made those footprints is still why we're searching. Uh, and now again, that comes into, you've seen all kind of hoax where people are doing these things. Uh, and, and I think it's all because these tracks generally disappear. Uh, out of, you know, because we can't trace it to an origin uh, to say, okay, we, now we at the doorway or the, or the cave where it went into, let's go in there and get it. Uh, so we don't have that. Uh, and so typically that's been the problem when it comes down to the evidence uh, in the footprints or uh, in, in this keeping this whole thing mystical. When it comes to physical evidence, there's enough circumstantial evidence. If someone said that um, someone tried to break into my house, last night and I saw footprints going to the back door and I said someone's trying and you could see evidence of someone getting in. that's enough that would convict a person if they caught him we have that evidence on Bigfoot we have enough evidence that we could convict Bigfoot <laughs> you know for being Bigfoot there have been and there still is I mean there's there's good evidence out there of, of, of people taking pictures and but you know it's always questionable because Bigfoot evidence is always questionable. Now, here's the interesting, my take on Bigfoot. This is one of the reasons why I believe it's really hard to capture Bigfoot evidence or to see Bigfoot. As humans, we've been acclimated to technology. And from the day we're born, every year we get older, we'll lose some of our hearing. We'll, we'll lose a lot of the, the uh, high frequencies. Why? Because there's just so much noise. You know, when you get my age, you, you know, you can get tinnitus and you lose a lot of your hearing. But it's because there's so, so much noise uh, in our environment. And you have to understand that the, ma the vast majority of the United States is not occupied. As humans, we like to, to be together. But if you fly over Colorado, you know, you'll be flying over places that, that are untouched. It's just, that's just the way it is. Even California, you fly out of California and you'll see that we all like to congregate in cities and areas and the rest is just like untouched. So when you live in that isolation, um, your, your senses are a lot more heightened. So your hearing is more heightened because that's, that's the way you survive. We don't do that anymore as humans. We, we rely on technology, you know, to keep us safe. So the first thing is, is hearing. Their, their hearing is, has never been, is always heightened, and it never gets damaged due to loud noises and stuff, so their hearing is pretty good. But what people don't realize is there's been tests with human eyes that our human eyes can actually detect infrared. Now, our brains, over evolution, our brains have decided we don't need to see infrared. But there are scientists, scientific studies where they've taken groups of people and they've flashed infrared lights and their eyeballs have actually twitched. So the eye actually see the cones and your eye, they'll actually see the infrared, but the brain doesn't acknowledge that they saw it. So the person will just stand there going, no, I didn't see it. But yet the eyes moved. It's interesting. So at one point, our human eyes, and we have phenomenal eyesight. Again, too, it deteriorates due to technology. So now you have a Bigfoot that lives in this, this area where due to evolution, maybe the infrared capability is still there. So that means every time we put motion sensing cameras with infrared lights, they could see the infrared flash. They know to stay away from that area. Anytime anybody's out there shooting in night vision and they're using infrared lights. 
they can see the infrared light. There's, um, I just interviewed a lady the other day who claims to be able to see an aura. You know, they can see the energy. Well, we give off energy as humans. We give off radiation. We give off um, infrared. And our eyes were at one point capable of actually seeing that, but over the evolution, we've lost that. So now you have Bigfoot that has great hearing, has eyes that can, that can pick up infrared, and there's a form of ESP. Now you go, what, well, ESP? Come on, give me a break. Guess what, we all have it. There's people out there that are very intuitive that can actually pick up this negative uh, energy. But we all have it. And, and if you don't think you have it, all you gotta do is think about, have you ever been sitting in your car at a stoplight or sitting in a, in a coffee shop? You just got this feeling someone's staring at you. You just got this feeling. And you can't see him with your peripheral vision, but you got to, and you turn around, some guy's staring at you. Happens in cars all the time. Guess what? That's a form of ESP. Now, Bigfoot, if they have that, it's been heightened. It's been accelerated due to their environment, due to the fact that that's part of their lifestyle of survival. So it's heightened. So not only can they hear when something is, is to, you know, different sounds from what they're used to, not only can they see pretty well and see maybe infrared, but they can sense you too. Now, as a UFO investigator and as a cattle mutilation investigator, I've set up cameras, night vision cameras, motion sensing cameras in areas looking for aliens that are, you know, supposedly doing the, the cattle mutilations or areas where there's Bigfoot sightings. And I'll never forget when I first started doing it, I was getting these great pictures of deer posing for the camera. I went, well, these are Moultrie game cameras. They're good cameras. This is what deer hunters and elk hunters use. And I couldn't, and, and I'm going, well, that's just coincidence. And then it happened again and again, the, you know, the different investigations, you know, deers are just sitting there and they're just, they're smiling at the camera. <laughs> I'm going, all right, enough of this. So I contacted one of the techs and I said, how do they know that the camera is there? He goes, well, first off, you know, Cameras, motion sensing cameras, it's, it's a sonar beam. And it's just like a, like a like with a submarine, it's a sonar beam. And when, when you break the beam walking by, it takes a picture. Okay, that's pretty much how it works, motion sensing. But it's a very high-pitched beam. We can't hear it. Maybe animals can. So if they hear, you know, you walk into an area and there's a ambient sound and you hear it, and as you walk by, it goes, it pitched because you interrupted the beam. They're gonna see where it came from. Animals are very, very in tune to their environment. So anything that's not part of their environment that even has human smell on it, they're gonna pick right up. So if you're out there looking for Bigfoot and, and you put your cameras up and stuff, well, if you just left your smell on that camera, you know, you know, I, I've got deer scent. You know, sometimes I'll spray deer scent on the camera to try and mask uh, human scent. Hunters do that all the time. And so you try different things. But then again, too, that camera is out of place. It is not supposed to be in the middle of a forest. And animals uh, that are very in tune, mammals are very in tune to their environment, can spot it right off. So there's a multiple things with Bigfoot that uh, I don't think they're spiritual. I don't think that they're, you know, that, that they're aliens. I think they've always been here. They may not be as abundant as we are. You know, we're, as humans, we're, we breed like rabbits. But, um, you know, a, a Bigfoot, uh, maybe they only have one offspring. Supposedly, the family may only be uh, you know, a male, female, and, and two offspring at the most. And then they travel, they have a clan, and once they leave the clan, they're on their own, and they're, they're like the proverbial crocodile Dundee doing walkabouts. And they stay moving, and they, they either follow 
weather patterns or they follow food patterns, you know, animals. It's really hard to say. So when it comes down to uh, the ultimate uh, evidence, uh, there's always the big question. How is some creature that maybe ape-like creature uh, is evading some of our most sophisticated ways of search? Uh, what type of technology does it have or uses? Um, and I think that spars the question uh, to take the Bigfoot theory off planet, right? Uh, but at the same time, why can't we find them? And I think that's going to be the biggest question of them all. And, and it's bigger than finding them. Because now that why? And we got to get past the narrative of, okay, it's, you know, it's legendary. Oh, it's secretive, like some, uh, you know, cat in the jungle that we haven't seen or some, you know, special, you know, jungle bird or something. This is bigger than that, of course. It's the Bigfoot. But the whole point is, why and how is this thing really evading us? And But yet we have sightings all over the United States that are popping up. And people truly are saying this. Now, we still got the other elements of never really catching the ungrainy photo. Uh, however, I still have a thing for that because I'm a UFO investigator. So we get the same question. And the reason for that is most humans and people, when they see something, tend to try to zoom in on the, with, the, with their phones. Uh, and what they don't know is that pixelation happens and then we have to zoom in on that. And now the footage uh, because, you know, your camera on your phone doesn't have a 500-foot zoom lens. So quite naturally, you're going to do that. And so that answers that question of the grainy photo. So we're going to get that. Uh, but the other part is, how are they hiding? And the other part, are they cold-blooded? Because they have to be uh, if we don't pick them up on radar or any type of, a, you know, the, the, the heat sensors, like a human would if you were looking for something. So what causes that? Is that part of their DNA? Is that part of their technology of camouflage that's built in within them of hiding? And it could be just standing right there. So I don't know. We need to look into that. Out of all the areas that I've investigated, I've never investigated a case where it was a direct harm to human beings, is what I'm trying to say. Now, granted, if you shoot a Bigfoot, they're going to retaliate. You see an alien, you shoot an alien, they may retaliate. If you happen to see these guys or these things, I don't know how they think, you know. So if you come across Bigfoot, you know, same thing with cattle mutilations. We've had UFO sightings. We have balls of light sightings around cattle mutilations. Who's ever doing it? They're killing cows, but they're leaving the carcasses with the ranchers. Yet, the ranchers themselves may be afraid, but I've never investigated a case where the ranchers have been hurt. I would like to start thinking as a fan, is there anything happening with Bigfoot that'll actually produce the results that we're looking for? And what would that result be? And that would be a real live Bigfoot standing before me. I don't know. I don't think we're there. And even in Death Valley, uh, California, I was part of a research team, but I helped them research uh, the area and, and, and gave the information to the team out there. But supposedly there's areas in, in Death Valley where there's these caves or something where people have seen gigantic skeletons. It's kind of interesting stuff. Now, I've tried to do a lot of follow-up on it, and they didn't find the skeletons they were looking for, but there was enough enough stories you know in the area from people that have lived there for years that have come across these large skeletons and they'd be about the size of a bigfoot so it'd be kind of interesting to see whether or not it was actually bigfoot or we have giants living among us at one point but out here in colorado uh i've seen bigfoot footprints I've seen them in the snow. I've seen them, you know, in the forest. And uh, I've, had, I've done a few investigations out here, enough to know that there's something big running around out here, and uh, you better respect it. <laughs> One of the 
phenomenal parts of this Bigfoot legend uh, was that the Native Americans uh, really revered the Bigfoot. Uh, in fact, uh, they looked at them as more spiritual beings. And it's said that they even had ceremonies uh, where they would worship the beings and also literally um, ask them for guidance. And so, which probably in all, you know, state that they didn't see them as any type of uh, bad uh, bad source of you know energy or some type of spirits or even uh, a bad entity itself and so uh, the Bigfoot was seen uh, as good in the Native American history. You know when you, when you talk to people that actually have had first-hand experiences it's just like when you do UFO investigations it's hard to call them well are you lying? Now I could have taken any of these guys and done a polygraph test and I can guarantee they would have passed the polygraph test they actually saw what they saw. But uh, yeah, Bigfoot's out here. And uh, you can see uh, there's uh, evidence. Matter of fact, if anybody's in Colorado, if you go to Bailey, Colorado, there's a Bigfoot museum there. And there's a nice big map that, that shows you uh, recent sightings you know, of, of uh, Bigfoot. And, uh, it's pretty cool. I always go up there and talk to the guy who runs it and, and get all the latest. <laughs> you know, of what's going on in that area. So when I started doing a little more research and, and wondering were there any other sightings or have anyone famous uh, actually seen a Bigfoot? And, and what I discovered, uh, there was a report from uh, a climber. His name was uh, Sir Edward Hillary. Uh, he was one of the first persons that climbed Mount Everest. And what the story said that why he was there, him and his Sherpa, uh, was making camp, and what they seen while they was there uh, really blew them away. Was a ape like creature that walked by uh, their camp while they was doing that, and and since that was more documented, I think that was probably one of the earliest stories of the Bigfoot or Sasquatch uh, story. And, and and besides, of course, we have all heard of Jimmy Carter, uh, one of our ex presidents. But this one here probably stood out the most and probably lend the most credibility because of the environment that it was seen in. I actually talked to someone that works for our government that says that our government has been tracking Bigfoot. Now, unfortunately, I can't verify that. All I could verify is the fact that he worked for him. But he told me some stuff that I learned as an investigator that was kind of like, huh, interesting. And they said they're able to track them from satellites because of the heat sensors. We have spy satellites. I, when I worked at Rockwell International, I was part of a spy satellite program, and I only knew that much. But I learned enough about the spy satellite that um, it could pick up heat signatures of humans walking by. Now, so you have a human now that's 10 feet tall and, you know, three and a half, four feet wide, would be a pretty good heat signature. We all give off, like I said earlier, we're all radioactive. We all give off infrared. We all give off radiation. We're a, a living circuit. So they're able to track clans, maybe not families as much as if they, if they knew where they were. But supposedly every so many years, based on what this guy said and then based on some of the Native American stories I've heard, sometimes the families get together back to their clan for a little bit. Now, supposedly here in Colorado, um, some of the stories are it's above Fair Play where we have a continental divide. That area is supposedly where one of the clan meets. And that's just based on talking to local investigators and um, local Native Americans out here in Colorado would be the Ute, uh, uh, Ute tribe. So in any of these uh, phenomena, especially the legends of Bigfoot, we still have to deal with hoaxes. Uh, people who are going out here making fake tracks, breaking tree limbs, uh, maybe even putting on the outfit itself um, because you do hear this a lot. That makes it more difficult because you're looking for the evidence and then someone want to go out here uh, and put a hoax. Now, the question is, could that be a government operative throwing us off the trail, creating misinformation to really get the public not really interested in the, the Bigfoot legend? Uh, we don't know. 
But that's always been something I've always wondered. Why would somebody want to do that? Okay, it's, it'll probably be funny. It will probably be a story for the ages. It probably can go viral. But what would happen when they out there do it at hoax and then they find themselves standing in front of a real Bigfoot? And the Bigfoot is saying, well, why are you doing me like this? You know what I'm saying? You're causing so much problems for me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think that will be a conversation. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> Did a, an investigation in Golden, Colorado, and uh, we, we found markers. And when we were following the markers, one marker would go this way, and then another one would go, and then what it does, it, it actually pointed us towards a stream. So then we started following the stream. We come to this opening area, because it's really thick out there in the woods, and we're a good 10,000 feet up. You can start smelling something, and like a skunk. And then the hair on our arms started, you know, and it, was, it felt like we were being watched. Anyway, we, we decided, okay, maybe it was just our imagination because we, we smelled something unusual. And usually there's an unusual smell to Bigfoot. Um, some investigators claim that what they do is they, they kill skunks and they use the, the, the scent uh, gland of a, of a skunk and they rub it on them to, to take their scent off. So we decided, okay, we, we think we're being watched, so we're going to follow the stream back. And, and when we were following the stream back, there was a, a log that had dropped or fallen. And a pretty good size when it was an aspen. It was a good size log. And so we decided, okay, f there was four of us, and we're talking. And when we hit the log, Joe and I are going to stay back there. I have my, my camera. And the other two guys are going to keep walking, and they're going to be talking like they're talking to us, carrying on a conversation, and we're going to hide. And so we went to that log, and we hid behind the log, and we had the cameras. We were there a couple minutes, and we could hear the stream, the water in the stream, and obviously you could hear, splash, splash. I swear to God. Splash, splash. Something bipedal, two legs, was walking in the stream. Now that kind of makes sense. That's how you hide footprints, you walk in the stream. Splash, splash, and it was getting louder. And I'm all like shaking, and, and Joe wears glasses, and his eyes are bigger than his glasses. And I'm like holding the camera like this, and I got it on, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, this thing's gonna come up on us. And we're there, and, and, it, and it stopped. And we couldn't hear walking in the stream anymore. And so we waited about 10 minutes, and we go, I don't know what happened. Oh, maybe it made us. You know, maybe you knew we were here. So we got up and started heading back towards the stream. And when we got, we started following the stream back a little bit. And we're only talking about maybe 25 feet or so, not that far. Yeah, there were these big boulders on the side of the stream and you could see water splash marks on the side of the rocks of the boulder, you know, the, the boulders. So something was in the stream and at the last minute decided to jump on the boulders and leave. And that was pretty cool. So what, I don't know, I can't tell you for a fact it was Bigfoot, but whatever it was, you know, it seemed like, you know, it, it, it jumped a good five and a half, six feet up on this boulder and, and, and took off. Now, there's always been stories that have come about, one in particular, the wild man of the woods, uh, or the Neanderthal man, all of these stories. Um, now, I don't, some of the stories I've heard, uh, which are similar to the Bigfoot, relations but these stories seem to appear that this is more human related uh than the bigfoot uh these are found throughout the united states uh and people kind of acknowledge it uh and and probably in a little more acceptance than the bigfoot legend uh and so but then i've read stories where uh there's been evidence of the wild man surface and then uh quickly the government or something swoops in and shut down the investigation of that. So maybe, again, this is something that they do know exists. And, and so there we go. They're always hiding something they don't want us to know. I went back and did another investigation in Bailey, Colorado, where two women actually saw a Bigfoot with their own eyes run by. They basically heard this, this like a tree branch snap and this Bigfoot run by, and he not really too far away, and they, he was so close that they could see gray hair on him, like maybe he was older, you know, because they get gray hair too. 
and they were in shock. Well, we heard about this, and it's really cool because the more you do Bigfoot investigations, the more you realize that they're very in curious, and and males are very intrigued with female humans too, <laughs> and they like to watch the women. And I think what happened was, is this male was watching these these two ladies walk, and he was just spying on them, and the tree branch snapped. We actually found it. It was a, a branch about this big and it's probably about two, two and a half inches in diameter. You can see where it was broken. And, and right where it was broken, a little further down, we found Bigfoot footprints. Some other stories are sometimes they, they like to show themselves. You know, they'll, they'll you know, they'll run inside, uh, run outside and, and, and present themselves to other people like, hey, look at me, you know some other stories. I don't know. I always like to think that maybe he kind of screwed up. And <laughs> now when I interviewed him, I asked him, I said, was anything unusual, anything unusual happened to you before you actually saw the Bigfoot run by? And they said, no, not really. You know, we were, we were walking through, uh, you know, the woods and stuff. I said, did you feel any, like anything thrown at you or anything that not thrown at you, but thrown in front of you? And they go, no, and the other lady goes, well, that was that pine cone that hit me on the back, you know? And I go, where? And I go, well, over here, we, wa we walked back and there was no pine trees with pine cones on it. So at that, and that's another thing too, is sometimes they like to get your attention. And so they'll throw things at you. <clears throat> we investigated that one and uh, found footprints. I went back again uh, a week later, I brought with me a, uh, a guy named Daniel who lives in an area and he's a search and rescue. And his job is to look for people who are lost in the National Forest, uh, the, the U.S. search and rescue team. And I, I, I brought a, an actual tracker with me to teach me and to look for, and this guy found all kinds of evidence. So not too far from where they were, we found footprints in the pine needles they couldn't make casts of them because there was just, they, they, it was the footprint on a pine needle and you can see the outline. And it was in a run, it was nine feet between left and right foot. So that was the time where he was kind of running. There was a dirt road that came around a corner and there's a big tree here. And then it was really cool because at the edge of the tree, you could see after Daniel pointed out, he goes, yeah, this, Normally this is where we would see a human sat here because they're lost and they don't know where they're going. They sit down, but whoever sat here had butt cheeks this big. <laughs> and you can see an imprint to the right side as if someone put their fist on the ground to get up. And he pointed all that out. He goes, it's not a, it's not a nest or deer den or anything like that. He goes, it's clearly someone was sitting here. The more I worked with Daniel, the more I realized that even the search and rescue guys come across Bigfoot evidence, and he has in the past. <clears throat> he told me a story where a lady had uh, well, was lost, and search and rescue went out, and they split up. And so as he's going in one direction, his partner's going another direction, and he gets further in the woods, he hears a like a, like a whistle. And he's saying, huh, I wonder where that's coming from. Maybe it's you know, the lady or something, or... So he started following that sound, and he followed for probably a good hour or so, just like, you know, just, just nothing, just like, like a, a hey you type of little whistle. And darn if he didn't walk right up on this lady, and she was standing next to a, a stream crying. She was lost. Something had guided him, or someone, or a Bigfoot had guided him to the lady, and he found her. That particular Bailey case made it on Finding Bigfoot, the TV show. So one of my Bigfoot cases actually made it, you know, a TV show, because it's such a good case. It was really such a good case. And since then, we've had Bigfoot sightings. I live in Colorado Springs, and we've had Bigfoot sightings uh, at Pikes Peak, and Fair Play, and, well, of course, just on the other side of Fair Play, we have um, the Continental Divide that basically separates the, the U.S., the, the left side and the right side of the U.S water from the left side of the continental divide goes into the Pacific, well, you know, to, the, to the Atlantic, that goes way up. So the theory is, is uh, the Bigfoot are traveling north to south, south to north along 
the uh, Continental Divide. Just like if you go to the East Coast, the Appalachian Mountains are the same way. The Bigfoot follow that too, because we've got a lot of sightings of Bigfoot in that area too. We actually had a, a sighting that, that was a 911 call. This was on Gold Camp Road, which is just outside of Colorado Springs. And uh, I went up the next, early, early the next morning to see if I could find evidence. And I did find a, a, a big rock on the side, it's a, just a dirt road that, that follows a mountain. It's a four by four road. And I, and I found a, 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 like a big rock that was pushed aside, like something stepped on it. And then I found an impression in the middle of the street, but just like one, but it what didn't look like a footprint. It was just like an impression. And then there was a, a, a ledge on the other side. And then up here about maybe five and a half feet, you can see where something jumped. You know, I mean, yeah, it could have been an elk, you know, but this is exactly where the eyewitness said, you know, a Bigfoot ran by or, you know, maybe some giant guy in a ghillie suit, you know, but that was pretty close. And I think Bigfoot, even for you, for you all making movies on it, you know, it's always intriguing because there's not a lot of evidence out there. Uh, so the storytelling part is, is probably the best part. All, I, all I'm basically saying is, you know, just be aware that uh, they may not be here for us. They're here for them. Same thing with Bigfoot. You know, if you come across it, just remember you're just a human. 